Lovely, are we all here? No. <laughs> Did you sleep well? Yeah. Good. Uh, I hope you like the shirt. I think I've stepped out of line because I put it on because there was a lot of them around. Oh, I still see a few. So I thought, I'm going to join in. I'm going to be part of the in crowd. So hence the ensemble this morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. Some of you are staying here. Some of us are day visitors. So there's a special welcome to day visitors, which includes me. I wanted to just share a little something with you this morning. As I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about what I heard um, yesterday, um, it, I was thinking a little bit about words, and I was thinking on the lines that the Bible is our written word, uh, where we can go for anything and everything. Jesus is the word in the flesh, and we need to, as his followers, be really, really careful with our words. And um, I think some of you already know that I like my little book of quotes. If I hear something that I like and I manage to write it down, I put it in this little book of quotes. And this is a quote. I don't know where I got it from, but I think it's really, really worth listening to. And it says, A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word heals and bless. And so I think that's one of the things that we really need to take on board. Before we say anything, it's good to pause, especially if the word comes out of a, a heart that's a little bit cross. We need to pause and think. If it doesn't encourage, it's probably best left unsaid until you calm down and thought about whether you need to share that word or not. So that was my thought this morning. And um, then, because I always want to turn to the word, because that's better than anything else, just a very short one here. Um, and this is uh, Jeremiah 31, and you will know it well, verse 3. It says, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. That's a mixture of versions, actually. Um, and we do well to remember that, because that's what we want our words to be. Whatever we take on board and learn from our teaching sessions and anything else, we need to learn to share the word of God in a godly manner, and not from a heart that's cross or upset, but from a heart that really wants to encourage. And so that's my little thought for the day. Father God, thank you for this amazing man of God. Thank you for the oil of blessing and righteousness that you've poured out on his life. Thank you, Father, for that amazing grace which is so clearly displayed in his testimony. From rags to riches. Father, continue to bless and anoint the word that comes to repeat right now. It's been good to uh, be with you over the weekend. I've uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's uh, I am I am pretty Welsh. I've lived in Wales for a long time. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a <laughs> I've lived there for a long time, so I'm, I don't know if I should say this, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, uh, whenever uh, Wales plays rugby, uh, I will cheer Wales. It goes, but it goes worse than that. Whoever plays against England in rugby, we <laughs> oh, will always support them. <laughs> so, uh, so that, that means that I am quite Welsh in the thinking and everything else living there. But. Uh, did you know that I'm got Cornish blood? <laughs> I don't know whether you realise that, um, but it's been super coming back to Devon. It's not Devon. I mean, you're all very, very posh. It's a, it's a B. It's D E B N. That's how you spell Devon. <laughs> so, uh, but it's great to come back here uh, in this area. It's lovely to uh, hear accents which are uh, right and proper. <laughs> 
And it's been good. I mean, uh, one of the great things, when I when we were in Scotland heading a church up there, we then moved down to Sing, a place called St. Geneth in the, in the valleys in Wales. And uh, somebody said to me, what, what are the Welsh Valley people have? The valleys are very, very different from Cardiff City and Swansea. They're just, you know, if you don't, I mean, it's just the hills difference, but man alive, there is a lot of difference. Um, the valleys people, I would say they are WYSIWYG. <clears throat> that little phrase, what you see is what you get. Um, you can, uh, you, you, you can't fool them. Um, so, like, they are, and so, but, but, but that's, but the, seriously, listen, that is like people from Devon and Cornwall, from, from what is the true southwest? I mean, they sort of, some people say to me, uh, you know, are you from Bristol? And I'll go, no, I'm not from Bristol. Bristol's in the blinking Midlands. <laughs> and then you get this other group of people, sort of Somerset and Dorset, and they try to sort of infringe themselves and say they're part of the southwest. No, they're not. It's Devon and Cornwall, that's it. You know, anyway. Um, but just looking at the... Uh, my chains fell off. I don't know if you, I mean, some of you might realise that I, I do a little bit of co done conjuring over the years for the, just sharing the gospel. But I've also done escapology where I get myself <coughs> chained up. And uh, as we were singing it then, I just thought, I remember, there's a, the, in, in Wales, there's a place called Kevin Kruber, which is sort of north of Bridge End. It's I don't know if it still is, but it's classed as the longest village in the UK. Um, a friend of mine was the pastor of a church there, and I started doing a lot of work with him, uh, and uh, we had some great times there together. So, I was as an evangelist, I was putting input into the church as well. And so, saying, they were saying, "How can we go forward in evangelism and, and reaching and everything else?" And so, I met with the, some of the leaders, and I said, "What sort of things go on here?" And I said, "Do," and they said, "Well, we used, there used to be a firework display." Um, but it's been cancelled and it's, it's died out a bit now. I said, well, look, why don't we have a, why don't we have a, a why don't we have a big bonfire, and uh, and have a firework display? And then the one of them turned around and says, yeah, well, so and so owns a farm. He's got a farm in Kevin. I said, oh, brilliant. So then I said, look, what we can do is we can. Have you got a trailer? And he said, yeah, we've got a big trailer in the farm. I said, look, I'll get a, a thing called Charles. It's like a big board that high uh, and there's all holes up through it and it's a skeleton on it and I basically get myself chained to this thing and I said I'll get myself chained up and then I can preach the gospel for the people there but little did we realise that this is I mean I'm an evangelist so we could sometimes be a little bit evangelistic with our illustrations um, <laughs> but uh, I have to say that virtually every person in the whole of the village turned up at this event we had a free sack, you know, barbecue stuff and everything else. It was it was brilliant. But then I got myself, so I got two people up to hold this board. To, well, I'll get chained to it. And then I thought, I'll, I'll invite a lady up to sort of assist me and do the chaining up. So I I get myself all chained up. This lady comes up and helps me and everything else. And uh, we're able to share the gospel with her afterwards. Uh, and so one of the people said, uh, you do know who you chose, don't you? So I said, no, I never said I was saying I didn't know her from Adam, but probably I'd better say I didn't know her from Eve. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so they said, you, you don't realise who she was. So I said, no. They said, uh, well, she works in a nightclub in like, Bridgend or Swansea, and she's a, a stripper, and she also uses chains in her act. <laughs> And I thought, man, I love it. that's interesting. <laughs> so when I, my chains fell off, and I just thought, I thought about that situation there, and uh, you never know what's going on, do you? And, and I'm going to say something else that I didn't realise what was going to go on uh, as we go through this this morning. We're, we're a bit away we are, yeah, that's fantastic. So if, you, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to just get out of, uh, out of um, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 242, but we're going to move over, well not going to move, we're still going to go back there, but uh, one of my favourite passages in the Bible, I've got to admit, I, I just love this chapter, uh, One Corinthians, we've already mentioned it before, we're going to look at it again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, we'll pick it up from verse 1, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Now I would remind you brothers of the gospel I preach to you. It's a heck of a lot of stuff in here. I'd love to go off on this. I'm not going to go off on this. So I'm just, I'll just get on with the passage, mate. Okay. I would remind you, brothers, the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you of first importance uh, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. It's all keyed into the word. I'll get on with it. Um, uh, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom is still alive. I'm just going to go off one little bit. I was, a number of years ago, I was uh, in Mandal in Norway. I was uh, doing some training on evangelism in the Bible college there. And uh, we were having coffee together, and I was talk talking to one of the guys who was one of the main lecturers at the Bible college. So we're chatting away, and I said to him, so uh, how did you become a Christian then? What made you become a Christian? He said, well, he said... I'm from a sort of an atheistic background. He said, but then I read through this passage and it says that um, uh, when Paul, that it says that Jesus appeared to 500 people and many of which were still alive. He said, so that meant to say that people could actually go to them and say, eh, we, we, did you, uh, did you, oh yeah, we saw the resurrection. Which, in other words, it's, it's proof right there and then. And he said, if that was the situation, then man alive, it must have happened. And he, anyway, he became a Christian. Anyway, we've got us back to the passage again. <laughs> uh, where are we? I've lost it now. Yeah, I don't know he appeared to Jack. Uh, that's right, 500. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles. Uh, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So continuing the parallel with Hope Church's building, and the hope in Christ that we have for those who trust him and, and keying it into our passage Acts 2.42 and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer as you approach um, Hope Church building you, you sort of move towards it and uh, it looks really good <clears throat> But I guess that you, you go through the, I've not been there, I should have gone, to, I would have actually been able to give us this fact, but uh, as, as you approach it, I, I guess you go through the doors into the lobby. Is that, is that right? Is that the lobby? Yeah. I mean, is that, do you call it the lobby or do you call it one of these posh? I mean, that's what he said to me, he said, I remember going to a church. <laughs> Go on. Sorry, I'm going to go off on too many stories here. I remember going to a church and they'd had a big building plan done to it and everything else. And then through the week, I'd done a, a kids program down in the basement of the church. And I and I was preaching there at a family service on a Sunday. So I said to them, I said, so, and the, the, the main area, the main, main hall was had been all done up and everything. So I said to them, I said, where will I be preaching on Sunday? They said, in the sanctuary. I said, in the what? They said, in the sanctuary. I said, what's a sanctuary? They said, well, the sanctuary upstairs. I said, listen, God isn't impressed with your building. There's only one sanctuary that he's impressed with. That's our heart. So what is this funny word that we have? Anyway, so you, you would call it a sanctuary. I was trying to catch you out, but you didn't call it that. So that's okay. So uh, you might well be in the in, in at the entrance, but there's so much more to enter into. And we've been brought into <clears throat> fellowship through Christ. If we put our faith and trust in Jesus, there is a process. <clears throat> Acts 2.42 is a process. They move from being unsaved, but they ask the question, what must we do to be saved? Peter said to them, repent and, and be baptized and put your faith and trust in Jesus. And, and then they come into a real living experience of what God had done in their lives and then they long for more. So, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're not a spare part in the body of Christ. I have a friend of mine who, who rather cynically, he was a church leader, he re who rather cynically stated that some folks are like our appendix. We don't know we have it till we, they give us trouble and then we're better off without them. <laughs> but Christian, Christianity is not a static religion.
but it's a living, exciting experience. And as we move into the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer, we begin to discover that our place and that ultimately this is going somewhere. The whole thing is leading somewhere. And, and as we look at it all, we realise, as they would have realised, that we are here for the lost. The reason God brought us into his family is so that we could reach the lost. Now, this is where I'm wrong. And I didn't know I was wrong. But in my notes I've got, and it should come up on here. Let's have a look, we can press the white button. Yeah, see, it comes up. Have you seen this thing over here? Um, so on my notes it says as you enter Hope Church there is on the wall a plaque John 3.16 it's your declaration but it's not <laughs> it's, I've been told no we haven't got a plaque we haven't got something stuck on our wall uh, where did that come from then <laughs> I nicked all these pictures <laughs> Seriously, I've been on his web page, I've been on your church's web, I've been on getting pictures of the building and etc, etc. Ask John to send stuff through. And I said to him, and he said, no, we don't have a, we don't have a plaque like that. It's, it's great. I faded it a bit so that you can see the building <coughs> behind. But it's like a, it's like a, a, I don't know, slate background. And in the middle it's got the world. And then around the edge it's got... For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. John 3.16. And for me, it was saying it's a declaration of why you're there and what you're doing there. But the plaque isn't there. So hang on a minute. Is this Pete Hodge with poetic illustrations that he's just gone off and did another one of his wobblies? Or is this a statement to say, maybe you should have a plaque on the wall. And maybe it should constantly remind you why you're there. Alistair Begg, who's a Scottish pastor in America, a guy that I listen to a lot and I think he's a superb preacher. And he says this, he says, what we need to understand is that first of all, that the Bible tells us that we were made by God. We were made for God. And we were there, that we, we were made for a relationship <laughs> with God. Salvation is not a reward that is given out, nor is it an achievement to which we can point. It's a gift. It's God's grace. Now you see, when a person discovers grace, it's because they've discovered Jesus. And when a person discovers Jesus, it's because they've discovered grace. It's all keyed into you. Discover Jesus, you've got grace, you've got grace, you've got Jesus. They're, they're, they interlock. And, and as we've already been looking at through 242, um, there are four distinctive marks of the early church. The church is learning. Secondly, the church is sharing. Thirdly, the church is worshipping. And fourthly, the church is growing. It's a learning, sharing, worshipping, growing community with the outcome is in evangelism. The, the early church grew through evangelism. Just, just flick through these pages. Listen, flick through these pages of Acts. Acts 2.41, Peter preaches the gospel. 3,000 get saved. 2.47, the Lord added to the number day by day of those who have been saved. Peter preaches again in chapter 4, verse 4. Many of those who had heard the words believed, and the number of the men came to about five. This is growing like mad. <clears throat> 4, 19 to 20. He was told to stop preaching. The, the people in charge of the area said, listen, stop preaching. I love his reply. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Uh, I was in Queen Street in Cardiff a number of years ago now, uh, preaching away, and I had a painting board there. <laughs> I had a big crowd there painting away. I turned around, put something up on the board, looked, and there in front of me, just hanging his head around the edge of the board, was a policeman. And he said, move. And I said, no, I'm carried on preaching. He walked off. <laughs> I often think that when I read this passage. So, um, and they were told, they were, 
So they, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, well, you must judge. But we cannot spare, but speak of what we have seen and heard. Then Acts 5.14, and more than ever, uh, believers were added to the church, multitudes of both men and This is incredible. Heavy persecution hits them. The leaders are imprisoned and killed. The church is scattered. Chapter 8, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word, getting the gospel out. And the rest, as they say, has got his history. Or actually, it's his story. So the question has to be, if it is evangelism, what on earth is evangelism? guy called Leith Anderson, who's an American pastor, he said that uh, the simple definition of evangelism is those who know telling those who don't. <laughs> it's a quite simple one, great, I like that one. Or another person has put it, I guess you wrote this one, uh, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Lee Strobel is a Christian author and uh, uh, former investigator, investigative journalist. He wrote this. I'm all for lifestyle evangelism, but I'm also in favour of intentionality, where we speak out at opportunities for spiritual conversations and are equipped to explain the gospel and why we believe it. Rick Warren written books like The Purpose Driven Church and everything else. He says this, he said, every church needs to grow warmer through fellowship, deeper through discipleship, stronger through worship, and larger through evangelism. But of all the people, I think this is the best quote when it comes to evangelism. A good friend of mine, Roger Carswell, well, I remember sitting down and I said, come on, Roger, give me a short sentence. What's evangelism, mate? And this is what he said. Evangelism is preaching the gospel to the unsaved who are listening. Evangelism is not just doing things. Evangelism is preaching the gospel. It's the gospel. We have to be gospel people. We have to be intentionally gospel focused. So evangelism is preaching the gospel, and it's no point preaching the gospel to a bunch of Christians. I remember, I won't give this illustration, but I was invited in a church once, I said, no, I wouldn't give it, but I'm going to. And, and, and they said, come along and preach at the gospel service. So I said, do you get uh, unsaved here? Well, you never know. So I said, what do you mean you never know? So they said, well, you never know who's going to come on. I said, well, do you normally get visitors that you like to pop in? No, we don't, but you never know who's going to turn up. So I said, well, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. Because uh, they also said, you never know who's going to walk by outside. They might hear what's going on. I said, well, that's the easiest route. Let's go all outside. We'll preach it. So I'm going to know who's walking by. But anyway, so it's preaching the gospel to the unsaved. And also, it's not only preaching the gospel to the unsaved, it's preaching the gospel to the unsaved who are listening. We've got a responsibility to catch them, to cause them to stop, so that they will listen to what they're doing, what we're saying, and they'll hear the gospel. So evangelism is preaching the gospel to the unsaved who are listening. Well, what is the gospel then, Pete? If the gospel is the key thing, what is the gospel? Okay, here we go. Simple one. Little finger. What? First of all, God loves little old you. You might be small, you might be insignificant, you might think of all the rest of the fingers on hand, little me, I'm not very important. Listen, God loves you. He set his affection on you and he longs for you and he's got a plan and a purpose for you. So God loves us. There is a problem. There's a problem and it's this. Actually, if I was to use this one, this is the ring finger where a promise is made. What actually happened is that Adam and Eve broke the promise. They disobeyed God. They got things wrong. We go wrong because we are wrong. We, they, we sin because we are sinners. It's the right, it's the problem that's there. And that has to be dealt with. The tallest finger of all stands above the rest. And it's this because it stands for Jesus. Jesus is a very, very person who was sent to this earth to, with, for, with a mission, not just to show us a better way of living, but he lived a perfect life and he died a perfect death with a perfect resurrection so that he could deal totally with our sins. In actual fact, when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished, paid in full, dealt with, everything paid for, nothing more than I have accomplished what I was sent to do. Jesus is the only answer. And then the last one we got over here is actually this one. It's actually, I would say it's like two sides of a coin. Uh, sometimes we get, we'll only emphasize one side and there are two sides to this coin. Because you see, I'm important to God because God loved me. He, th there's a problem with my sin. Jesus came to deal with it. And then what needs to happen is that the two sides of this coin is repentance and faith. Repentance by itself will not save. 
It's repentance and faith. Faith by itself will not save. There has to be repentance. It's like we're going down the road, we're living our life, we're doing our own thing, we realize we're going in the wrong direction. We think, this is taking me to a lost eternity, and I need to stop going in the direction I am, and I must turn around totally. It's turning from what we know to be wrong, and putting our faith and our trust in God's one and only answer. So God loves us. Sin's the problem. Jesus Christ is the answer. And we must, put our, we must repent of our sins and put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus. The, you see, the, the gospel, in actual fact, when you don't let you can put a thumbs up because you got it. <laughs> the gospel is for decision, not simply for discussion. Now, listen, okay, and then we're going to quote to you. Yeah, but I'm going to win. It says in the Bible, come, let us reason together. There is sin to be a scarlet. Be... And listen, there is time for discussion. But ultimately, it's for decision. I've been to so many alphas where people go along and go, well, you know, just sound the answer serious thing. Now, listen, there has to be a stepping over of the line. Now, I'm all for the journeying aspect of our faith. There's an aspect to it as well. We see that free scripture. But ultimately, the journey has to say, you have to make a decision. And the decision is, listen, you're on that side of the line and you have to step over the line and put your faith and trust in Jesus. It's for discussion, but also it's for decision. And when we look through Acts, we see that's what they did. The, the cry from them in Acts 2, what must we do to be saved? Peter didn't say, well, listen, get your act together, guys, just still. You know. Pull together, let's all have a nice time. We'll come along to church on Sunday, we'll have a nice little knees up together. No, 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 no. He said, to Repent, turn from your sins, put your faith and trust in Jesus. So, the gospel of grace is Jesus plus nothing. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it must focus us back to the cross. That's what we're going to do with communion in a minute. We're going to focus ourselves back to the... We don't move from the cross. We just move deeper into the cross. Because we think, man, alive, he did that for me. This is incredible. I've messed up this week. I've got a place I can return to and get myself right with God again. So the gospel is grace is Jesus. It's by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone. And it must focus us back to the cross. And it says, and they devoted themselves... To the apostles' teaching and the fellowship of the breaking of bread and the and the and prayers and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done uh, through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and the church grew. Why? Why did the church grow? There we are. Let's have a look. What does it say? God never intended His church to be a refrigerator in which to preserve perishable piety. He intended it to be an incubator in which to hatch out converts. That's what it's all about. The church is an incubator to hatch out converts. So don't get it too extreme. This, I, 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 I've actually brought along for every single one of you a gift. That's, I don't know, you can see you're really, really excited. <laughs> get on with it. Well, I actually don't get too excited. It's nothing big, but I've got to... I got a bundle of these little booklets. They're called uh, "Turn to God." Uh, a number of years ago, I actually put this one together. It simply explains what it means to be a Christian. It talks about how you can put your faith and trust in Jesus in a prayer. It goes to what I was saying—the four points I was talking about earlier. Thumbs up. They're they're in this little booklet, and uh, I'd like to give one of these to each of you. And. Uh, Actually, when I wrote it, because it's written for non-Christians, really. It's so a non-Christian can understand what the gospel is and how they become, a, become right with God. So when I wrote it initially, I actually did a draft copy. And uh, if I was sat on a plane or a bus or whatever, I was travelling anywhere, I would uh, sit next to somebody else and I would say, excuse me, yeah. you, you don't happen to be a non-Christian, do you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. I said, could you do me a favour? I said, listen, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and I've actually written this little booklet and it explains to a person how they can become a Christian. But uh, would you do me a favour? Could you read through that and see if you understand it and if it makes sense? Oh, okay, fine. 
It's only four pages. What did you think about it? I mean, did you understand it? Yeah, yeah, it was quite clear. So, what about it then? <laughs> <laughs> I kept it as a draft for a long time. <laughs> um, and if they didn't understand it, it would be quite helpful as well. So, uh, But it was interesting. So you might be sitting there this morning thinking to yourself, Pete, listen, I listened to you over the weekend. I uh, understand what it means to be a Christian. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm sort of, un, I'm unsure. I, I don't know, I, I don't know, I just, Pete, I, I've got sneaking doubts. I'm not sure where things are. I, I, listen, if you were to say to me, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I don't know whether I am or not. Oh, it's a cup of coffee. So what can you do? So you can take it away. And you can read it for yourself in your own time. You can go down through it. It talks about the fact that God loves got a plan for your life. It talks about choices. It talks about uh, sin. It talks about the fact that Jesus came to die on the cross. It's even got a prayer or commitment that you can actually pray. And you can put it right with it. And it, it's just so you can take a copy of that. I'd love you to have a copy. But you might be sitting there. Maybe that's not you. Maybe you're sitting there this morning and saying, uh, Pete, I know I'm a Christian. But I need, I, I, I hear what you're saying, that we're here for reaching the lost and that's what we should be doing and we should be sharing our faith and everything else. But I just get locked up. I just, I just, my brain goes dead. I goes blank. I'm not sure what to say. Just for you. You might be sitting there thinking, oh, that's fine. Read it through. Check it out for yourself. Make sure that you got it. Four steps. That's not complicated. And thumbs up at the end of it all. So a copy for you. Or well, you might be sitting there thinking, well, actually, Pete, I, I, I'm not in the first category with a person who's not sure that they're a Christian. I'm not in the second category because, uh, you know, I'm not confused by it all. Actually, Pete, I do understand it, and I am fairly clear with it all. But I've got a copy for you because, well, this is for you because what I would love you to do. Because you might be sitting there thinking, Pete, can I have a copy of that? Because when you were saying about that, I just thought about, I thought about so-and-so. I've often went, I need to share the gospel with them, but if only I had a little booklet called Turn to God, that I could share it with them, and I could maybe I could even have coffee with them this week and, uh, and say, listen, um, you could even make my line. You could say, you know, this is written by a person that we heard over the weekend, and uh, initially he wrote it uh, for, 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 it's written for people who aren't Christians, and he asked them to, if they could understand it, and so you could sort of use that line with them as well, and say, would you like a copy? But, so it's a copy to you, so I think it covers everyone here, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, what I'm going to do is take the elastic bands off, and I'll uh, put the two guys sitting in the, in the cheaper seats. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, if you, so we, could you just pass them around? There's plenty there for it. So if you want to nick more than one, you can do. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's an important thing. I've enjoyed my time with you over the weekend. I, I pray that it's been of help. Uh, my prayer for you as a church is that you will continue to be devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. Using that as a springboard to reach the lost and that the Lord will add to your number those that are being saved. And as we lead into communion, it's a reminder of what he was willing to pay for our salvation. In my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. God bless you.